All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm Bob Trug. I'm the director of the uh, Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And I'd like you to welcome you to the public forum that is preceding our annual bioethics conference over the next couple of days, which is on the question of defining death, organ transplantation, and the 50-year legacy of the Harvard report on brain death. You know, my kids have always told me, Dad, if you want to be popular, you're going to have to talk about something besides death. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad to see that there's at least a few people here who are, share my fascination with the subject. Um, before we begin, though, uh, I want to say a very big thank you to the uh, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and the Health Sciences. Uh, I can't tell you how they bailed us out here. We had this program planned. Uh, many, many months ago, the dates were all fixed, and we could not find a venue anywhere. And uh, I called up Deanne and Ken and uh, said, you know, any way you can help us out. And they have been so kind and gracious to us. We have the provost here, uh, you know, from the uh, president on down, the administrative staff, the IT staff. You guys have just been unbelievable. And so I want to I thank you for making this possible for us. All right, so uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, if you go back to the late 1960s, there were a lot of developments that were happening in life-sustaining treatments, particularly mechanical ventilation. And people were beginning to ask the question, you know, when, when are these ventilators saving lives and when are they merely prolonging death? And similarly, this was when organ transplantation was just beginning and people were asking questions about when is it okay for us to take organs from a patient. And so, in 1968, under the leadership of Henry Beecher, a committee was formed at Harvard Medical School to really address both of these issues with a new way of determining death. So in addition to the traditional way of determining death through your heart stopping, this was a way of declaring death based on the loss of neurological function. Brand new idea in that, in that sense. Through the 1970s, this gained traction. 1980, there was a President's Commission which endorsed it and then came up with our Brain Death Law, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, or the UDDA, which has now been adopted by, uh, in some form by all 50 states. The concept has been enormously successful in, in, in all of the ways that they imagined. But interestingly, it's also had a lot of controversy around it. One of my favorite lines in the literature was written by Alex Capron, who's here with us tonight, when he wrote, if one subject in health law and bioethics can be said to be at once well settled and persistently unresolved, it is how to determine that death has occurred. And it, I think this sort of captures it all. The most uh, recent area of controversy has been the case of a young woman, uh, Jahai McMath. I'll tell you about her story in a moment, but I'd actually like to say that it's not just one story. I think there's two very important stories here. The first has to do with the concept of brain death and uh, how her case is important to our discussion on that uh, is going to be one focus of, of what we talk about tonight. But the, the other story about Jahai McMath is a question about race, culture, uh, economic status in our society, and how some groups of patients have been denied access to medical treatments that are available to the rest of us. And I think this is another important story to be told about the McMath case. Uh, Professor Michelle Goodwin, who's going to follow me at the podium, is going to focus on this aspect in her talk. Uh, the bios are all in your brochures, but I'll, I'll briefly say a word about our speakers this evening here. Professor Goodwin holds the Chancellor's Professorship at the University of California in Irvine. She's an international expert on issues related to human rights, reproductive justice, bioethics, and health law. So she'll speak to these cultural, political, and racial tensions that I think are present in the McMath case. Professor Alan Schumann will speak next. Uh, he is a pediatric neurologist, former vice chair of neurology at UCLA, 
And along with uh, Jim Bernad, I think the, these are the two neurologists that have really had the biggest impact on how we think about the concept of brain death. And uh, Professor Schumann's work has been influential from the councils of the Vatican to the President's Council on Bioethics in 2007. Um, he has examined McMath, and he's going to share with us his assessment of her neurologic exam at this time. Um, much of this has not been uh, publicly discussed anywhere else before. I do have a special request when he is speaking, if you could not take photographs or videos of the material that he's presenting due to its sensitive nature, so if you could refrain from that. You can take all the pictures of me that you want, however. <laughs> Uh, finally, uh, we've called upon Professor Arthur Kaplan to help us uh, make sense of this, provide us with guidance for how to move forward. <coughs> Professor Kaplan is a, a philosopher. He has founded and run programs uh, at the University of Minnesota, the University of Pennsylvania, and currently at NYU. Uh, he's an authority really on any topic in bioethics, but he is particularly well known for his expertise and leadership uh, roles that he's had in the ethics of organ transplantation. So uh, let me begin with a little overview of the McMath case. So this is who we're talking about, Jahai McMath, um, uh, obviously before her illness and then more recently, and we'll talk about that. So uh, in December of uh, 2013, 13-year-old 13 girl admitted to Oakland Children's Hospital for complex pharyngeal surgery for obstructive sleep apnea. She was admitted to the pediatric ICU and later that evening she began spitting up blood which led to a frank hemorrhage and about 12.30 in the morning she had a cardiac arrest. She was resuscitated with return of spontaneous circulation but with severe neurological injury. Two days later the chief of neurology at the hospital performed an exam which was consistent with brain death. He also did an EEG, which was isoelectric, iso so she had flat brain waves. The following day, the exam was confirmed by a second neurologist, and so at that point, she was formally declared to be brain dead. On the 15th, the hospital informed the family that the ventilator would be removed the following morning. This is fairly routine. After the diagnosis is made, if a patient is not an organ donor, then the ventilator is stopped within a reasonable period of time. Uh, but the family objected, they retained an attorney, and the hospital agreed to continue ventilation, uh, ventilation temporarily. On the 20th, the judge issued a temporary restraining order requiring the hospital to keep McMath on the ventilator for the time being, and the judge asked the chief of child neurology at Stanford to provide another opinion and examine McMath, which he did. The exam was again consistent with brain death, and the cerebral blood flow study was also confirmative. There was no evidence of, brain of blood flow to the brain. On Christmas Eve, the judge ruled that McMath was legally dead, but he did require the hospital to continue ventilation for some period of time to allow the family to explore other options. On the 30th, further legal motions were, fault, were filed, but these became moot when the family and the hospital agreed to release McMath to the custody of her mother with continuation of the ventilator and the intravenous fluids. Uh, the family requested a tracheostomy and a feeding tube before uh, she was released. They did not agree to do that. Per the plan, on January 3rd, the coroner issued uh, a death certificate, uh, which cited her date of death as December 12th, the day that the uh, brain death was confirmed for the first time. And then on January 5th, per the plan, she was released to her mother's custody, transported to a hospital in New Jersey where tracheostomy and surgical feeding tubes were placed. Why New Jersey, you might ask? Um, well, New Jersey has a law that prohibits the determination of death by neurological criteria when this would violate the personal religious beliefs of the individual. And its law also prohibits payers from denying coverage to individuals based on their personal religious beliefs regarding brain death. So where are things now? She's been uh, discharged from the hospital. I believe that most of the time she is in an apartment in New Jersey uh, where she's cared for by her mother and nurses. Uh, she has a ventilator to breathe for her. 
Um, so uh, in this picture here, you can see the ventilator in the background there. What you can't see under her shirt is the tracheostomy tube, which goes uh, through her neck into her windpipe and uh, is attached to the ventilator. She's fed through a tube in her stomach and, and receives supplemental hormones. So four years after she was certified as dead, she continues to grow and develop. So why is this case interesting? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite a case. Uh, how do we make sense of this? And in particular, we have here a child who continues to grow and develop four years after being declared dead. How does this fit with any common sense meaning of the word dead? So in preparing my uh, comments for this evening, I uh, wrote them down and then I wrote them up and um, they'll, they'll be published in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association shortly. But it is available now online uh, at jamanetwork.com, although you don't have to read it because in the next less than 10 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to tell you what it says. Uh, <laughs> I think that the key to understanding the case of Jahai McMath uh, centers on appreciating the differences between biological and legal categories. The law tends to favor bright line distinctions, uh, yes or no, black or white, no in between, whereas biolo biological categories tend to involve a continuous spectrum. And I'll give you the two examples that everybody always uses when they make this point. Uh, the first one is how we differentiate the category of child from adult. So from a legal point of view, the transition literally occurs in an instant. On the moment a person becomes 18, they acquire a completely new legal status. They go from being a child to a person with all the rights, privileges, and obligations of adulthood. So legally, it happens in a moment, but biologically or psychologically, obviously, typically not much has changed for that person from the day before. So the law drawing a bright line across a continuous biological spectrum. The other example is the category of sighted versus blind. Legally, people are blind when their vision is poorer than 20 over 200. But of course, we all know that visual acuity occurs across the spectrum. So we've got the law drawing a bright line on a continuous biological spectrum. Now, how might we think about this in terms of brain injury? Brain injury also occurs on a spectrum. Uh, at the top, we have the uninjured brain. But there are some signposts as we progress through brain injury. So we have the minimally conscious state, the permanent vegetative state. Near the bottom, but not at the bottom, is the state we call brain death. And then really at the bottom is where the brain is entirely necrotic, what's sometimes called a liquefied brain. And these have their conceptual correlates. So for the minimally conscious state, that's uh, conceptually somebody who is only intermittently or partially conscious. The permanent vegetative state is a state of irreversible unconsciousness. Brain death is irreversible unconsciousness, plus you have to have substantial damage to the brain stem, such that the parts of the brain that drive respiration are destroyed. So patients who are brain dead cannot breathe at all on their own. And when you don't breathe, that's called apnea. And so conceptually, we can think of brain death as irreversible apneic unconsciousness. And then at the bottom, we have no function at all. So that's the biological way we might look at this. What about the law? For most legal purposes, a bright line distinction between alive and dead is critical. Think about it. We must know precisely when people may be buried, when their wills may be executed, when efforts to keep them alive may be terminated, when they may donate their organs, when a crime should be considered a homicide. All of these, I think, you know, really need the bright line determination of the law. So if we're going to draw a line across this continuous biological spectrum, where should we draw it? Early on, people suggested it should be drawn here, that you should be considered alive unless your brain was completely liquefied. Others, uh, including two people we have in the room, Bob Veach and Dan Wickler, at various times, have proposed that the line should be drawn at the level of the permanent vegetative state, because this is when you are irreversibly unconscious. 
and everything that matters to who we are as beings depends on consciousness. So if you've lost that, you should be considered dead. We didn't choose either of those. The line that we chose in 1968 with the Harvard report and ever since, the line that we've chose is the point of irreversible apneic unconsciousness. And we've written these into our guidelines. So we have guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology for adults, the American Academy of Pediatrics for children that define when a person is brain dead. And I, I want to emphasize that the, the line they draw is very sharp and very precise. So, you know, if any qualified physician walks into an intensive care unit, they're going to be able to go up to a bed space and tell you definitively, yes or no, this person is or is not brain dead. They're above the line or the below the line. It'd be extremely rare for it to be uncertain. So this draws a very sharp line across the biological continuum. So that's kind of a model uh, of, of how we might think about it. How might it apply to the McMath case? Well, I think, you know, one of the surprising uh, aspects of the case is that she has had this prolonged somatic survival, now more than four years. Um, and here I think, you know, my, my experience in pediatric intensive care, I think, uh, has helped me to, to think about this in a different way, because we take care of children at all levels of brain functioning. Fortunately, most of them have an uninjured brain, but we also have children who are in a minimally conscious state, many in a permanent vegetative state. We have children who are just above that line that we call brain death. And then we have those with varying degrees of injury below the line of brain death. Now, those above the line are all alive. And we always offer to, to uh, use life support. And of course, most of the time, that's what parents want. Some of the time, particularly for children near the lower end of that, uh, parents will say no. You know, the, the degree of brain injury is such that we want to stop life support. And of course, we respect that too. But our experience is that for these children who come in, you know, like for example, somebody at this point right here, uh, they come in, we treat them for their pneumonia, this, that, and the other thing. They get better, they go home. These, these children can live for years. Now, below the line, we don't offer treatment. Um, and I suspect that uh, in 2013, Jahai McMath was probably at somewhere around this point here, just a little bit below the line. But the point I want to make is that biologically, she's not that much different than a child a little bit above the line. Biologically, they're very similar. And so, since children just above that line can live for years, I don't think it should be surprising for us that somebody like Jahai McMath can also live for years. So if that's true, why aren't there more cases like Jahai McMath? And I think we have an answer for that too. The diagnosis of brain death is almost always a self-fulfilling prophecy, quickly followed by either organ donation or ventilator withdrawal. Very few families insist upon continuing life support in the face of such a poor prognosis. Even those who do insist are typically overridden, since brain death is recognized as legal death in almost every state. But in the rare cases where life support is continued, I think it should be no surprise that prolonged biological survival is possible. Now the other question that comes up is what if Jahai McMath is no longer brain dead? So in a few minutes, uh, Professor Schumann is going to uh, tell you about his uh, uh, assessment of her neurological status and doubts he has that she currently fulfills the AAP for criteria for brain death. If true, this could be the first case suggesting that the diagnosis of brain death by established criteria may not be irreversible. And this could really be kind of a bombshell. You know, when, uh, when I sit down with parents whose child has been diagnosed as brain dead, I can look them in the eye and I can say, you know, never ever has there been a case where we've made this diagnosis and anybody has ever gotten better. And I think that's been an important thing for me to say. And if what Professor Schumann uh, suspects is true, then we won't be able to say that anymore. And I think that that's going to be important. But one of the final points I want to make here is that even if it is true, perhaps it should not be surprising. And let me say why. So going back to our spectrum here, um, we know that uh, it, uh, this is actually a very interesting area of neurology right now. We know that there are patients 
who were thought to be in a permanent vegetative state. They thought that they were going to be permanently unconscious. But now, several years later, they've actually improved to the level of a minimally conscious state or even beyond, something that was thought to be impossible uh, before. Um, you know, brain injury doesn't always get better. Sometimes it get wor gets worse, but sometimes it get gets better. These cases have been clearly documented. If those are true, then why would it be implausible necessarily to think that over a few years, Jahai McMath has also had some improvement in her brain functioning? Now, biologically, again, that shouldn't be all that surprising to us. Of course, the striking thing here is that by having some degree of improvement in her functioning, she has now crossed that legal line that we've drawn. And, uh, you know, so legally she's gone from being in the dead portion to being in the alive portion. And I think, you know, that's going to be an important thing for us to grapple with and to, and to think about how we want to talk about that and how we want to explain it to others. So in closing here, uh, I think in making sense of the McMath case, I think with regard to prolonged survival, we know that children with brain injuries similar to, but slightly less severe than that of McMath, may survive for years. So I don't think it's surprising that McMath has, has survived for years, and she could survive for quite a few more. This, by the way, is not news. Alan Schumann has documented a number of cases of this uh, in, in the literature. Um, and, and in fact, she's not even close to a record. The longest clearly documented case is somebody with somatic survival after the diagnosis of brain death for more than 20 years. So uh, you know, at four years, McMath could go on for quite some time. Um, and then secondly, brain injury may improve or get worse over time. Many documented cases of patients in a PVS have improved to an MCS over several years. Should it be surprising if a similar type of improvement sometimes occurs at the more severe end of the spectrum? However, I do want to conclude, I, I think that this case does not present a fundamental challenge to the concept of brain death or the UDDA if we understand those concepts uh, in, in terms of how legal categories relate to biological categories. In my view, the UDDA draws a very reasonable bright line at the level of irreversible apneic unconsciousness. I think it's really important for us to remember, this is a very, very severe degree of brain injury. Um, and uh, so I think it's quite a meaningful line and, and, and a reasonable place to draw the line. Furthermore, uh, this line has enjoyed wide societal acceptance and has truly saved hundreds of thousands of lives by making organ transplantation possible. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, we're going to have discussion, obviously, at the end. I'd like to turn it over to Professor Goodwin now Thank you, at the podium. Yes. All right, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me here, Bob. Thank you all for coming. I've friends who are in the audience, and I'll be scoping around to see if I can actually land my vision on you. I've been asked to speak to some of the cultural uh, components of this, what this means. So it may be a, a little bit of a pullback from what you just heard, and then we'll open up with more nuance. And I'm doing this low tech. I know so many of us are used to just clicking through our slides, and those were good slides, Bob. Those were very good slides. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to walk us through in a, a low-tech way of a conversation and open it up for later conversation. The, the first thing that I want to offer, and this relates, is to think about the 50th year anniversary of the passing of Dr. King. And you might wonder why in the world would that be relevant to talking about this particular case. But it does have some resonance. And that is, in 1966, Dr. King was asked, why was he going all across the country and talking about more things than just people being arrested for protesting for their civil rights in the South? And he said, I refuse to segregate my moral concerns. It was that same year that Dr. King said, of all of the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most inhumane. Now you might wonder what we know Dr. King for is in fact those protests supporting voting rights to end segregation and education and housing and so much more. 
For any of you who heard him when he surrendered the floor um, so that Fannie Lou Hamer could actually speak about voting in the Mississippi Freedom P Party and her speech about what she encountered and others, all in what she said, the account of wanting to vote. And she spoke of this inhumane brutality of being beaten in all sorts of ways and in her head and so forth just because she wanted to vote. And yet, with the backdrop of all of that, he would say that injustice in health care is the most inhumane. You might wonder, well, why is it that Dr. King could come to that conclusion, given all of other devastation that we knew of the time around 1966 and before? But I would venture to say that Dr. King was thinking of a variety of things. Dr. King was well aware of African Americans dying on the steps of segregated hospitals in the South, being denied treatment. There was no law at the time that permitted them or gained them a right to have access. Title VI later did, but he recalled those times. Dr. King knew well about the medical experimentation, coercively so, against black bodies that had extended through the period of slavery into modern times. Some of you have read about the HeLa cells and Henrietta Lacks, but more thinking about the kinds of experimentations by people like Marion Sims and others, where it'd be hard to say that that was, in fact, voluntary and consensual when African-American women were being roused in the night. And you could find this in Marion Sims' autobiography. It's so revealing as he talks about having epiphanies in the middle of the night and rousing the black women that he kept at the back of his house and then lacerating them, experimenting on them as he tried to come up with new technologies in the reproductive health care realm. But Dr. King also surely knew then about the massive scale of our own version of eugenics in the United States that was carried out across racial lines but implicates class and that is to say the forced sterilization of black women throughout the South. And sadly we've even seen contemporary cases of it but it was really quite robust in states like South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi and so forth called the Southern appendectomy, right? including being done on young girls as young as 10, 11, and 12 years old. For those of you who are interested in hearing about the narratives of people who have survived that, Elaine Riddick does a very powerful job of talking about what this meant in her life. A raped girl who, when uh, she delivered, was, um, was sterilized. Uh, and she didn't know about this at all, only had wondered over the years why it was that she couldn't become pregnant until finding out as an adult that she had been sterilized against her will and against the will of her grandmother. But it's important to know that that's not just a racial line, that's also a class line. For those of you who are familiar with the case Buck v. Bell, 1927 case, that went before the United States Supreme Court. as a case that actually involved another young girl. She was white. Her name was Carrie Buck. Carrie was poor and lived with a family that was somewhat confusing. They were a foster family, but they put her to work. She was poor. It's said that her mother was an alcoholic and a prostitute and was held at a place called the Virginia Colony. Carrie was raped by her employer's nephew. She became pregnant. And in Virginia, where they were experimenting with eugenics laws, the first state to have a eugenics law was the state of Indiana. There are other states that adopted such laws. And there were efforts to try to make sure that every state would adopt a eugenics law. Virginia did. And its law provided for the sterilization of people who were thought to be socially and morally unfit. You can imagine how broad that category is. But you can also know the people who are left out of that, right? Wealthy people are never judged to be socially and morally unfit, at least not to the extent that someone could sniff anything on their body and get away with it. 
in her case, she was taken to the Virginia colony and she had a test case that went before the Supreme Court. Her lawyer was actually a eugenicist, a person who supported eugenics. And the case went up before the, the, the United States Supreme Court to determine whether or not it would be legal for the state of Virginia to forcibly sterilize individuals like Carrie. And the Supreme Court, in a near unanimous decision, said three generations of imbeciles is enough. The authority that the, the, the court under Oliver Wendell Holmes is 1927, compared sterilization, forced sterilization to vaccination. Said that the power and authority that a state had to impose vaccination was broad enough to cover, quote, <laughs> snipping the fallopian tubes. The court said better than for offspring of folks like Carrie to starve for their imbecility, the court said or to blanket communities in crime, society was better off not allowing them to continue their kind. And so it wasn't just black folk, in fact, uh, that had to be concerned about this kind of course of medical interventions, but also poor white people as well. And that was 1927, but the campaign of forced sterilization did not actually end there. And the campaign continued even after World War II. And the final mark in history that I'll share with you, but there's so many points along the spectrum. And this is one that arises quite often in thinking about race and medicine in the United States. And that happens to be what's euphemistically known as the Tuskegee experiments, which lasted more than 40 years in the United States. And this is where a campaign between Johns Hopkins and also um, the United States government engaged in a practice where hundreds of African-American men, many of whom were illiterate farmers who had syphilis, were denied appropriate care and treatment and transparency about the medical study that they were in. Many people confuse this experiment thinking that the experiment was really about monitoring them when they were alive. If you read the documents actually involved in the uh, medical experimentation on these men, you know that it wasn't about their life, it was about their death. They wanted to hasten their death so that they could s examine the bodies after death. What so many have seen as so cruel in that backdrop is that even after discovering the benefits of antibiotics and penicillin, these men were yet left untreated. They were given the equivalent of sugar pills for decades. They infected their wives and their children were born impacted by their untreated diseases. <coughs> So surely when Dr. King said just two years before he died that of all of the uh, injustices that that in healthcare, of all of the any forms of inequality, that injustice in healthcare is the most inhumane, I can't help but think that it's part of this backdrop that he was referring to. Now how does that implicate our charge today and over the next couple of days in terms of what we think about. Are these issues of the past, do they have any kind of relevance in our present? And I would venture to say that in fact they do. For example, how many of you are aware of the study that was published last year uh, and it was a study of University of Virginia medical students and residences and it appeared in the Washington Post. Are any of you aware of this study of, okay, just a couple folks. Well, it's a fascinating study, so I commend you to look at it because it's a kind of fast forward to see where we are. And the study asks the students and the residents questions with regard to race. Now questions that if I asked this audience, you'd say those are just ridiculous questions, such as, do black people and white people have different density of skin? You'd say, well, that's just kind of silly. Who'd go around asking that? Well, in fact, researchers did. And it turned out there was good reason for them to do so because they saw across first year, second year, third year, fourth year medical students and residences that they thought, yes, black people and white people have different density of skin. 
that black people have a different tolerance for pain than white patients do. And down the list. And I, I, I urge you to look at it because it places these historic moments in a more relevant present context. And as we've tried to get our mind around these issues, scholars have Edmund Pellegrino in 2007, it was, published a book about African Americans and bioethics, a great book. A few years before, the Institute of Medicine did a book on unequal treatment. And this ties to Jahai's uh, case. And that is, in the book, there was an effort to, as best as possible, look across categories of care and treatment. And that is to say, across these various areas of care and treatment, when might there be unequal treatment that could be detected? And this was across hundreds of categories. On every category in which they studied, there was unequal treatment. And the unequal treatment usually went something like this, which was that white people get better and more treatment, better quality of care than African Americans. And there have been studies since then to unpack, well, are there disparities when one accounts for education, when one accounts for insurance, when one accounts for the various things where you'd say, well, look, this only happens amongst the poor. Certainly it doesn't happen when people are better off and unfortunately, consistently, even people who are better off, who have quality insurance, who are educated, still experience disparities in terms of quality of care and treatment. But it's fascinating that in the study, there's only one area where it happened that African Americans received more treatment than whites did. And that was African Americans were six times more likely to have a limb amputated than their white counterparts. So how does this relate to the backdrop of the case in which we're talking about? Because on one hand, race really shouldn't matter. Culture and economics really shouldn't matter at all. Uh, as John Paris would say, dead is dead, right? And it doesn't really matter what we're talking about in terms of, of race. But I think what makes the case complicated from the parents' point of view, <coughs> and for those who've come to the support of the parents, happens to be the underlying questions of care and treatment. And that is, it shouldn't be an obvious outcome, or even a near obvious outcome, that after a tonsillectomy, that there should be a dead 13-year-old. That's the underlying challenge, the underlying quality of care and treatment before getting to the question of what is death, what is brain death. And so I hope that in our time today and over the next couple of days, we'll begin to explore that as well because it is an important piece of the discussion here. But I also want to raise with you the importance of thinking about what technology means in these spaces. And that is to say, technology outpaces law, although in this case we do have law, the UDDA that uh, was mentioned by Bob, and the California Code, Code 7180, right? She was declared uh, brain dead in, in California. And the definition of the California Code is the following. Uh, part one, irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function. And part two, irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including brain stem, is dead. A, de a determination of death must be made in accordance with accept acceptable medical standards. One would say that the law is, is pretty clear there and that death had in fact been declared. New Jersey provides an exception, as Bob mentioned, and that exception is that a neurological condition of death can't in fact be imposed when it violates religious beliefs. And that makes this realm deeply 
complicated. And that's not just complicated by race, white and black. That could be any particular religious community that believes that death simply doesn't occur when the skin is warm and when it happens to be moist, which is what her parents said. But I want to go back in my closing to this question about technology and how technology complicates this. Because being respirated and intubated necessarily leads to biological functions that would allow the skin to be warm and possibly, if moisturized, the skin to be moist. Right? I mean, that's it. And so how do we reconcile these issues and these times with the technology that provides for the very circumstance that we're looking at here. <laughs> and I'd also say that one other piece of complication with this along that spectrum of what is dead, what constitute brain death, what, constitute a, what constitutes a chronic vegetative state, minimal consciousness, comatose, etc., is also how doctors will intervene in this space. And here I want to just flag an area that I see that's complicated with doctors that's on the rise. And that is within the realm of reproductive health care and also end of life, there are more doctors that are claiming their own conscious abilities, whether to treat or not to treat whether to give care or not to give care. And this is irrespective of what we know about science and biology. And I would suggest that it will further complicate these spaces into the future. And with that, I'm going to close and look forward to hearing the other comments. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob, for inviting me to share some little-known information about Jahai's case. Let me begin with a disclaimer that I have not been retained by Jahai's lawyers, nor have I received any financial or other compensation from them or her family. From the start, I followed Jahai's case with great interest uh, through the news media. In December 2013, she clearly fulfilled diagnostic criteria for brain death. By early January, the media were reporting that multiple bodily systems were deteriorating and that cardiovascular collapse was imminent, an inevitable trajectory for a corpse on a ventilator. As a neurologist with a special interest in chronic brain death, I was not surprised that after being flown to New Jersey, where she became statutorily resurrected and was treated as a comatose patient, Jahai's condition quickly improved. <clears throat> In retrospect, the multi-system deterioration attributed to death was actually due to four weeks of no nutrition and untreated thyroid and adrenal insufficiency. With tube feedings and hormone replacement, she stabilized to the point of being discharged to an apartment where she remains to this day in remarkably good health. She has had virtually no intercurrent illnesses. Her skin integrity has remained excellent. She has undergone pubertal development with three documented menstrual periods in 2014, ongoing breast enlargement, and all the secondary sexual characteristics, implying preservation of some hypothalamic functions despite deficiency of others. She has had four hospitalizations, three brief ones for minor issues, and a recent one lasting a month for error in the bowel wall treated with antibiotics. When it became clear in early 2014 that Jahai could have a potentially long survival, I approached her family through their lawyer, thinking that her case fit perfectly with a series of chronic brain death cases that I had earlier published. Around the same time, her family began to report that she sometimes responded to simple motor commands. I shared the general skepticism about these reports, assuming that the family was in denial and misrepresenting, uh, sorry, misinterpreting spinal myoclonus as volitional. That's a rapid involuntary twitch generated by the spinal cord. 
They noticed that when Jahai's heart rate was above 80 beats per minute, she was more likely to respond, as though the heart rate reflected some inner level of arousal. The periods of alleged responsiveness occurred around five times per week, lasting anywhere from a few minutes to half an hour. Knowing that no one would believe them, the family began to make video recordings of command response sessions when Jahai's heart rate made them think she was most likely to respond. I've been privileged to be entrusted with copies of these recordings, 60 in total, 48 of which proved suitable for assessing alleged responsiveness. They span a total of, uh, sorry, they span a two year period and last from 13 seconds to 12 minutes each for a total duration of 97 minutes. All have been certified by a forensic video expert as unaltered. The first thing that struck me was that the great majority of the alleged responses were not spinal myoclonus or any of the other kinds of spontaneous involuntary movement known to occur in patients with high spinal cord injury. Most of the alleged responses were simple biphasic movements that were slower than myoclonus. Some involved more than one body part or were a sequence of movements. I surveyed some of Jahai's nurses who unanimously attested that such movements did not occur spontaneously. The videos confirmed that movements similar to the alleged responses were indeed rare when not requested, and I saw none during several hours of direct personal observation. I'll now show you 11 brief representative segments. Turn your head. This begins 40 seconds into the original video when Jahai's mother asked her to turn her head. After 39 seconds of coaxing, her head turns associated with the complex body movement. Trying. Come on, try harder. We just seen that you gotta try harder because they're gonna say that's not good enough. Show these people that you are not brain dead, Jahai. Show them that you are alive. Because they try to tell me that you're not alive. Can you believe that? They try to tell me that you're not living. There we go. Turn that head. That's what they try to tell me. Wake up, Jahai. <laughs> Turning that head. Much, you, you are definitely living. Yes. Turning your head, Jahai. We've seen that, and we got that on video. In this clip, there's a request to move the right hand and seven seconds later, the right arm moves. Then there's a request to move the left hand and 12 seconds later, there's a slight movement of the left arm. Jahai's mother asks her to move the left hand harder and a second later, it moves harder. Your hands. Very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got it on I'm so proud of you, Jahai. Can you move your hand again? Move your hand so we can see it. Uh, move it sorry, forward. Something, that's the wrong one. This is the one. Let's try it again. I got the video on you now, Jai. Go ahead, move your right hand. And do it hard where people can see it. Very good, Jai. <laughs> okay, can you move your left hand? Move your left hand, boo boo, where people can see it. I'm waiting. Very good. Can you move it harder? Yes. All right, Grubby. And now they can't say that you can't hear your mother. Uh, here Jahai is asked to move her hand and three seconds later there's a right hand movement. She's asked to move it again and uh, 12 seconds later the right hand and arm move again. Your hands. Very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got it on I'm so proud of you Jahai. Can you move your hand again? Move your hand so we can see it. Move it hard, too. Come on, Jahai. 
Very good. Very good job. Look, look, look at the thing below the hand. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Very good. That's very good, daughter. Your hands. Oops. So in this one, she's asked to move her left hand, and four seconds later, there's a left arm movement. Uh, something got out of order. Uh, no, we'll skip that. Okay. Um. Trying. Yes, you are. Good job. Move that left hand hard for me. There we go. There Good we go. job, Jahai. I see you moving that left hand. Good job, girly. In this video, Jahai's and asked her to give her a, a thumbs up. At 10 seconds, there's a myoclonic twitch of the left thumb, which doesn't count. Her aunt persists, asking her to put the thumb up. Two seconds later, there's a slow, non-myoclonic movement of the thumb downward. Her aunt repeats the request, emphasizing to put it up. 14 seconds later, there's a slow, non-myoclonic movement upward. Put the thumb up. Give us a thumbs up, Jahai. Give us a good thumbs up. Can you like try to concentrate? There we go. I see so you moving. That little twitch is a myoclonic work, which let's is see, involuntary. Let's see if you can. There we go. Doesn't I see count. you. I see you trying, honey. You, you, you just moved your thumb. Can you put it up? I know it takes a lot, Jahai. I know it takes a lot, honey. You're doing good, Jahai. You just moved it again. Put that thing up. I see you moving. There we go. There we go. Jahai seemed to follow commands not only to move, but also to relax. After a request for a thumbs up, the thumb moves, although not up, along with the second and third fingers. The fingers and hand remain visibly tense. At 31 seconds, her aunt tells her to relax, and four seconds later, the hand and fingers dramatically relax. I see you moving it, Jahai. Could you put your thumb all the way up? I see, Mama. Very good. <laughs> you frustrated. I see. I see you, you trying. As long as you're trying. Good job, Jahai. You did good. Good job, Jahai. She's not relaxing her hands. She's still trying. Mm -hmm. Relax, girly. Relax your fingers, Jahai. Good job. Very good, good Mama. Job. This video seems to demonstrate a surprising degree of comprehension. Jahai's mother asked her several times to move her middle finger, but without that term. Instead, she specifies it by circumlocutions. Ignore the quick myoclonic twitches of various fingers, including the third finger, but focus on the slower, non-myoclonic flexion movements of the third finger. Jaha, which finger is the bad finger? Good job. <laughs> she did move it. So ignore the Jaha, which finger would I move? Myoclonus. I'm not getting mad at somebody. Other fingers. Good job. And of that. Which third finger, finger is the there. FU finger, Jaha? When you want to, good job. Here, let me lift your hand up a little bit more so everybody can see. So when you get mad at somebody, which finger are you supposed to move? Not that one. That was my Aquinas. Good job. That, that's <laughs> not my Aquinas. Um, here Jahai's stepfather asks her to kick her left leg. Two seconds later, both legs move, the left more prominently than the right. He then asks her to kick her right leg, and two seconds later, the right foot moves. It's kind of hard to see it with that black masking over the black pad of the foot, but if you look carefully, you'll see it. Oh, Jahai, if you up, go on and kick your left leg. Hey! <laughs> Good job. Good job, Jahai. You did good. Good job. Good job. Good job. 
If you can hear me, kick your right leg. <laughs> Told you. And here's another leg example with a movement slower than in the previous clip. Jahai, kick your foot, Jahai. Very good, girl. Very good. I see you. And one final, a brief example. Jahai. We're trying to record you moving your feet. We've seen you wiggle your toes, but we need you to kick that foot like you did before, okay? Very good. <laughs> that is wonderful, daughter. That is wonderful. We got that on tape, too. Of course, not all movements were as soon after commands as these, and some commands were not followed by any movement at all. I've spent countless hours studying the 48 videos in detail, playing the devil's advocate at every step, and I'm convinced that the non-myoclonic movements following commands cannot be explained as anything other than genuine responses. First of all, there are not any types of spontaneous involuntary movement known to occur in spinal cord injury patients. The movements at issue were rare during baseline periods and much more frequent during periods of movement uh, sorry, during periods of command and coaxing. Moreover, the latency between command and the next movement was much shorter than would be expected by chance. Finally, there was a remarkable anatomical specificity. Following a command, the next movement was of the requested body part much more often than could be explained by chance. A Dudville's advocate would raise a number of objections related to the amateur way the videos were made. How do we know what the off-camera body parts were doing? How do we know that the family didn't take hundreds more videos and submitted only those that by chance seemed to support their claim, et cetera, et cetera. I've considered all the potential objections carefully and in the end find the counter arguments more compelling. If Jahai is intermittently responsive, then she does not currently fulfill criteria for brain death, the first cardinal requirement of which is unresponsiveness. Rather, she fulfills criteria for the so-called minimally conscious state defined in 2002 by the Aspen Working Group. They wrote, quote, in MCS, cognitively mediated behavior occurs inconsistently but is reproducible or is sustained long enough to be differentiated from reflexive behavior, end quote. Two years later, the lead author, Giacino, elaborated on the criteria, quote, diagnostic assessment is particularly challenging in MCS as a hallmark of this condition is behavioral inconsistency. Patients in MCS may show clear signs of consciousness on one examination and then fail to produce the same behavior during a second examination conducted minutes, hours, or days later. For this reason, serial assessment is essential. Serial assessment is precisely what the videos provide. The nomenclature of MCS and other disorders of consciousness may soon change as proposed by this recent article accompanied by an excellent commentary by Jim Burnett. I was privileged to examine Jahai in her apartment on December 2nd, 2014, which unfortunately happened to be one of her unresponsive days. She exhibited no brainstem reflexes and did not breathe over the ventilator during or during 20 seconds off it. If it hadn't been for the video evidence, I could easily have mistaken her for brain dead. To shed light on the state of Jahai's brain, she was transported on September 26, 2014 to Rutgers University Hospital for an MRI scan, MR angiogram and venogram, an electroencephalogram and a multimodal evoked potentials. The tests were facilitated by the International Brain Research Foundation and observed by Dr. Calixto Machado in this audience, who recently published a paper about the MRI and heart rate variability findings that reinforce the evidence for awareness. Before showing you Jahai's MRI scan, it is important to provide a context by comparison with three cases of chronic brain death that I've studied. This is the MRI of the famous TK who became brain dead at age four from meningitis and was maintained in that state for over 20 years. An MRI scan done 13.9 years into brain death showed no recognizable brain structure. The
the entire intracranial contents have been replaced by a chaotic jumble of tissues, fluids, and calcifications. Here's the MRI of a Japanese boy who became brain dead at age 13 months from presumptive viral sepsis and shock. These scans were taken at 4.8 and 5.5 years into brain death. There's not even a hint of any brain structure. This is the same boy's CT scan after just 1.7 years, by which time the liquefaction was already complete. This final example is from a teenage girl who became brain dead from a malignant brain tumor. By 10 months, most of the brain tissue as well as the tumor had liquefied in contrast to the viable tumor remnant that you see growing out through a pre-existing surgical burr hole. If Jahai were brain dead, we would expect her MRI at nine months to show a similar pattern of near total destruction. But here it is. There's astonishing preservation of the superficial and internal anatomy and surprisingly little cortical atrophy. The scan is by no means normal, however, with massive demyelination of the white matter and abnormal signal in the cortical ribbon. This slide, courtesy of Dr. Machado from his paper, shows 3D surface reconstructions of the right hemisphere, illustrating the remarkable preservation of the gyral pattern. There is cystic degeneration in the deep white matter uh, and parts of the corpus callosum. This sequence, uh, sorry, on the left is a mid-sagittal section showing not only the patchy lesions of the corpus callosum, but also destruction of the posterior pons and medulla. Does that arrow show there? Yeah. The axial sections on the right, in which water appears white, shows that much of the damage is in the unusual form of a midline slit and degeneration behind it. Little wonder that Jahai exhibits no brainstem reflexes. But notice that the upper brainstem here is grossly intact. And this is where the reticular activating system begins to ascend to the deep nucleus called the thalamus, right here, which is also grossly preserved. Since these are the structures that mediate arousal and alertness, it's tempting to speculate that its relative preservation, in contrast to the lower brainstem destruction, could account for Jahai's intermittent awareness despite her severe motor disability and absent brainstem reflexes. Jahai's MR angiogram and venogram showed no signal related to blood flow within the brain substance. There is flow in the supraclinoid segment of the internal carotid arteries here which are of abnormally small caliber. The vessels that you see here are on the, in the meninges or on the surface of the brain. From the extent of structural preservation, one can infer that Jahai's cerebral blood flow is not absent, but markedly reduced below the threshold of detection of the MR studies. Moreover, there must never have been a time when it was completely absent or else her brain would have undergone total liquefaction like the chronic brain death cases. At the time of her radionuclide scan in Oakland on December 23, 2013, cerebral blood flow must have been reduced to below the scan's resolution, too low to support synaptic function, but just enough to prevent wholesale tissue necrosis. This is the range called the ischemic penumbra. well known in the stroke field and hypothesized by the Brazilian neurologist Cicero Coimbra to occur globally as a mathematical necessity during the progression from normal flow to no flow in the pathogenesis of brain death. Jahai's case may be the first indirect confirmation of Coimbra's hypothesis. How to reconcile the MRI and MRA and MRV? Uh, we talked about that. Her, her neurophysiological test results were uh, no responses to anything. 
The EEG was isoelectric. The brainstem evoked response, showed no response, including wave one for the neurophysiologists. Somatosensory evoked potential showed no response, and the visual of a potential showed no response. So how to reconcile that with the behavioral evidence of uh, MCS? Obviously, reconciliation is speculative. I don't pretend to know the answer. Uh, and there's no time to go into it, so maybe some of you want to ask me about that during the Q&A session. Uh, Importantly, brain death is a clinical diagnosis, and ancillary tests can support clinical evidence for brain death, but they cannot trump clinical evidence against brain death. So in conclusion, since early 2014, Jahai has been in an MCS. Brain structure is much more preserved than expected for chronic brain death. And she was probably in global ischemic penumbra at the time of the original diagnosis, because global ischemic penumbra can mimic clinical brain death in every way and cause a false positive radionuclide scan. Final, finally, corpses do not undergo puberty. So uh, with that, I'll conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Schumann. Those were amazing uh, uh, imageries and uh, much to talk about there. Uh, I can't begin my remarks without noting that uh, while the Mass College of Pharmacy was very nice to uh, host uh, the Harvard Bioethics Center, it hosted my father when he graduated here in 1948. Uh, he uh, loved this place. So uh, he died, and I'm pretty sure he's dead, but he died uh, <laughs> about a year ago at the age of 98. Um, <clears throat> I believe it had something to do with the Red Sox winning the World Series. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm amazed that we haven't seen all sorts of disclosure slides up here when people ask me what has bioethics ever accomplished. This is something we've accomplished. It's a disclosure slide, and it actually uh, is something that uh, has no relevance to this talk. I don't have any conflict. Uh, and you may see me uh, leap to a chair shortly because uh, in my uh, march toward death, I have a, a bum knee, and so I've got to go get a knee replacement soon, and uh, we'll see how it holds up, but if that happens, I'll just uh, ask for a little help in changing the slides. Anyway. That was just meant to get you on my side as a pity. <laughs> so uh, a court recently rejected a Romanian man's claim that he's alive. Constantine Reelu learned in January that he was dead. This came as a surprise to him. He was working as a cook in Turkey for the past 20 years. He returned home to discover that his ex-wife had him officially registered as dead. He has been living a legalistic nightmare of trying to prove to authorities that he is, in fact, alive. He faced a major setback in court in the northeastern Romanian city of Vaslui when they refused to overturn his death certificate because his request was filed too late. <laughs> the decision the court said was final. That must be what uh, Bob was talking about with bright lines. I am a living ghost, he said in a phone interview with the AP. I'm officially dead, though I'm alive. And there he is. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody thinks they know what dead is, there are clearly different standards in the law than there are uh, in medicine or uh, science. There are clearly lines being drawn around sets of data that uh, may or may not be deemed as adequate by uh, some in medicine and science, and maybe within the law, but it is a uh, area that is relatively uh, murky. I want to remind you too, as we think about Jahai's case, the idea that different places have different criteria for death is uh, very much with us. It's not just a question of uh, dead in New York and alive in New Jersey. 
person officially declared dead in Hungary can be taken into Slovakia and be brought back to life. And it has happened, I'm told, a couple of times there. Jahai was considered dead in California and alive in New Jersey, with the exception that uh, Michelle told us about. And here uh, we see, uh, this is just a chart that shows different standards and tests that are used in a selection of nations. Uh, some uh, want to see uh, just CO2 declining. Some want to uh, see if you overbreathe <coughs> without the ventilator. Can you uh, breathe without it? Some don't worry about an apnea test. Some just use clinical signals. And some require more than one physician to do things and others don't. Uh, there's a lot of variability in how people get declared dead all around the world. We might agree, and I'll make a suggestion, that we kind of agree on what the definition is what we're, uh, in terms of what we're looking for, the total and irreversible loss of all brain function, or organized brain function, if you will, which maybe Jahai has come back from, or seen maintained, <coughs> because uh, levels of brain activity were not uh, measurable for her. But in any event, uh, that does not get unanimity with respect to the tests that ought to be done, or the technology that ought to be used, in order to decide whether someone meets the definition. And these lines, by the way, are all over the place. China, for example, has never recognized brain death. It impacts its organ transplant behavior in ways that are very negative. Some of you know there's controversy about where Chinese transplant organs may get sourced from. But there are many uh, places within the world that uh, basically require tests, don't require confirmatory tests, or leave it up to the doctor to simply pronounce death. And I want to remind you of uh, something else as we think about brain death. It isn't really the case that we've got a whole ton of consensus about cardiac death. <coughs> Indeed, <coughs> it could be argued that uh, brain death, for whatever its merits as a definition, as a test, and as a set of criteria to invoke those tests, is far better and more accurate at determining a bright line of death than cardiac death. Just before I came here, I spent a little time at the NYU Bellevue Hospital and then our Tisch Hospital, and I noticed a couple of things which will make Michelle nervous. One, we seem to spend a little more time resuscitating white people than black people. All were pronounced cardiac death, but seemed as, to me as if we were getting a few more tries, and we definitely are trying harder on younger people than very old people. That didn't inspire me. I'm not going anywhere near that place. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> cardiac death has no real agreed upon criteria whatsoever in terms of how hard you try to prove irreversibility. None. It has no clear upon definition about how many minutes you should wait to establish that cardiac function has disappeared. Some places wait five minutes in Canada before organ procurement begins on a cardiac death pronouncement. Other places wait longer. There isn't any agreed upon uh, time or, or advice. We published about this not too long ago uh, about when you call the code and say we're done. Um, varies all over the place. Depends on where you are, who you are. It actually varies a lot according to where you're trained. So there's a lot of disparity on that end of the spectrum. We tend to be pounding on brain death, but of course most people don't die pronounced by brain death, they die pronounced by cardiac death. So, the McMath case, if I was trying to look back and do a little bit of ethical autopsy here, it did involve an unexpected death in a child accompanied by mistrust, anger, and ultimately litigation, certainly uh, not anything that anyone expected to happen to the poor young girl when she went in to have this surgery to help her with her uh, apnea. Um, but it led to a good deal of distrust. I've seen a number of articles saying, you know, people just aren't listening to the parents. I think Michelle touched on some reasons that might be so. But there are also just hostility because, if you will, the hospital was seen as causing her death. And getting trust in whatever they had to say from anybody would be very difficult. Some maintains that uh, she shows that by attentive nursing care, brain dead people are not dead. That may be, I don't think we know. Uh, as much as Alan has studied uh, some people who've been declared brain dead and kept on machines, it is one gigantic research project, as is, by the way, the ability to come out of PVS 
and move to minimal consciousness. How long would that happen? How far do you progress? Would it ethically even be cruel to try and do what some are suggesting, that we try to make more uh, systematic efforts to wake up people from PBS if we move them to what some of you will know as locked-in syndrome? Is that an experiment we'd want to do? Is that something we've done to Jahai? I don't know. I'm just asking uh, that uh, you know what we infer from her case as a case is a small series, but it maybe we would like to uh, see what would happen, at least in animal studies or uh, in other situations in terms of where people are going, should we try to really aggressively intervene with them. Uh, some forecast that uh, giving a grim prognosis for those who want to maintain a brain-dead brain person undermines public trust in medicine. Uh, I do that. Um, the uh, worry is that... Uh, you know, people will get the idea if they learn about Jahai or others that everybody who's brain dead, even the 98-year-old dad of mine, is somehow going to roll back and have some areas of the brain intact and show arousal and attentiveness, which I doubt very much. The New Yorker article that sort of focused in on people being irresponsible, like me, in forecasting bad things for Jahai or others who are brain dead but that people try to maintain, I think that's exactly what doctors that I talked to said. I actually have no view empirically about what might be happening to a dead body that one tried to maintain with breathing or feeding or hormones or anything else. But it's certainly the case that most people who I talked with at uh, New York institutions would say it's pretty likely that it's going to be grim if you try that on uh, the average person declared brain dead. Now, maybe the young, as they often do, do better than the old, and that's entirely possible. Brain death has always been, as Bob Truog knows better than me, tricky in uh, younger people and newborns and so on. So, again, not sure. No doubt she was dead in California, both by legal standards and the medical tests uh, that were required. Uh, she was tested more than most and had outside expertise come in and do it. So um, labeling what she is now in, until Alan uh, had a chance to take a look at her, gets to be difficult when people are thinking, well, I don't know if I can trust uh, what the doctors are saying about who is dead. So if we wish to revise brain death definitionally, should it be possible to maintain cellular or vitalistic life in a body, does that require that we alter either the definition that we're using now or the testing? And I won't keep you in suspense. I'm going to suggest that it requires that we start to think about testing. Something's going on here at the limits of our measurement, and I think Alan put it pretty well when he commented about the penumbra of electrical activity that was tough to measure, and maybe something is under the uh, radar for us. We could be doing more uh, fMRIs on people who are prospectively brain dead, except it would cost us a fortune and most places don't have the technology. But maybe we want to insist that if someone demands or could pay for aggressive uh, testing with the latest and best technology, that that is something they ought to be afforded the opportunity to do. Not sure. So from the math case lessons I draw, I'm not sure the definition is wrong. I am nervous about the ability of our tests to detect and implement uh, the definition. That concerns me. <clears throat> I'm also not sure that we have enough evidence, nor will we ever, unless we get it out of animals, to know what really might happen with dead bodies. I am very sure that we have no idea what might happen if we took the average cardiac dead person and tried to intervene with them. And maybe we could prolong certain types of activity or resurrect it in them. That's possible. I don't know. But here's a company that thinks it's not only possible, but they're encouraging people to do it. This is looking forward now, moving away from McMath, but just to get us all freaked out here for a second. So there's a company called BioQuark, which happens to be based in one of my old haunts in Philly, that wants to see whether by inter uh, injecting peptides, stem cells, lasers, deep brain stimulators, can they reverse death? They're advertising this on their websites. Uh, the possibility that brain death could be reversed was reported this past year in hundreds of articles around the world. 
This is a typical story from the Daily Mail in the UK. Could we soon reverse death? U.S. company to start trials reawakening the dead in Latin America in a few months. And this is how they plan to do it. BioQuark plans to test their theory of this combination of interventions on brain dead patients. The method, which by the way has not been tested in animals, which might be a good idea. Um, but I don't think the animals can pay. <laughs> The team had proposed doing this last year in India, uh, but got shut down by the government, although they did get approval, apparently, from an IRB there. So, and this is off the website, to be declared officially dead in the majority of countries, you have to experience complete and irreversible loss of brain function or brain death, although this sounds final and absolute. I'm sorry, this is from a different article. A company in the U.S. believes it doesn't have to be. BioQuark is set up to do repair and reanimation we were reportedly told through the medical establishment, this is the president, that brain death is irreversible and should be considered the end of the line. Or is it? Have we come to the technological point where we're able to push the envelope to see if this is truly the case? In a certain sense, that's what has been going on with Jahai. Um, not with these kinds of uh, more modernistic interventions, but just sort of seeing, well, what would happen if, or what might happen if we maintained uh, someone? Is there some chance that they are just below the line that uh, Bob was showing us about where brain death is, but capable of going on or having even some function in some way return? Ira Pastor, uh, I know him, and he is not a uh, fringe player uh, in terms of his scientific background. However, uh, the company uh, is in Philly. Its labs are in Tampa, and I wanted to show you that... Uh, some of what the company's own advertising is saying, they take a unique approach to mimic the dynamics found during the natural reversal of disease, degeneration, and aging. That's regenerative medicine. Um, and so what they claim to be able to do is to merge knowledge from different disciplines to try and find techniques that will allow the brain to rebound. Um, the company offers, and this is what I want us to think about a little bit on the website, confidential, personalized support attuned to the most delicate and complex medical situations. And it tells people that they might want to contact them on their website. And what it's saying is, if you have somebody who's dead, call us. <laughs> we'll help you out. So the drive to deny death and use medicine and science to reverse it, hardly new, but is certainly being fostered by ambivalence about or doubts about or shedding uncertainty around that bright line of brain death. <coughs> this trial, by the way, that they're talking about is already on the NIH's clinicaltrials.gov list, which is not a place that necessarily sorts out good science or bad science, but it is there. And so if you were looking, you'd say, well, that must be a pretty good trial too. Um, Cardiac death is reversible. Even five minutes after a person's heart stops beating, their brain cells may still function, according to a just published study in Annals of Neurology just came out. For the study, nine people uh, from around the world had electrical signals in their brain monitored as they died. They all suffered from some kind of serious brain injury, and they all had DNR orders. And the idea was like a battery that loses its charge, this loss of polarization may be reversible, at least for a while said one of the neuroscientists in the study, Jed Harkins at Cincinnati. The chemical changes that lead to death begin with depolarization. That change begins the countdown to irreversible damage. But what he was saying is, it looks like perhaps with the right interventions, maybe we could get cellular activity to come back. <clears throat> that means using different types of electrical stimulation. And he believes the intervention may prolong biological activity in the dead, but not sure what that means in the cardiac dead. So <clears throat> we have a couple of interesting um, developments on the frontiers. And I didn't talk to you about a third development, which some of you may know, which is to try and freeze the body when it suffers what normally would be a fatal injury, repair it, and then reanimate the person. And that basically is taking someone, allowing them to be dead, fixing them and then bringing them back to life, which is a different angle on the ambiguities of death. So what should we be doing? Should we abandon brain death? I'm not sure 
that, again, the definition is wrong in terms of saying the brain can't <laughs> control anything. It's irreversible. But testing for that, I think Jahai and other cases may make us have to think harder. Should we mandate efforts at reversing death? Should everybody get a run at a technology or technique, cardiac or brain death, that gives them a chance after a few minutes to reanimate? I don't know, but I think that issue is coming. And I think it's going to come with economic implications. You'll notice I haven't even uttered the word transplant in these remarks. But um, that's because I think we better be sure that people are dead before we get involved with procuring organs from them. However, maybe the technology is soon to the point where we're going to have to go through a run of that before we decide to pronounce death more than we do. Um, do we have to get somebody's permission to be dead, or is it still going to be something that professionals do? So we haven't really uh, knocked at the door of doctors deciding. Remember that map I showed you of the world had a lot of places where doctors pronounce you dead. And that's their job, and patients basically don't play a role in it. But maybe it will soon become part of informed consent, at least if people say, well, even if they're dead, I would still like to take them home and see what happens. <laughs> maybe. Possible. And who's to pay? I think legislation has the answer to this. I hate to uh, sometimes point to our distinguished legislators as the place who, or the people who must resolve this, but I don't think we should litigate ourselves out of brain death. I think we ought to be having hearings, uh, try to listen to expert opinion, and revisit the subject as necessary to see whether the state laws need to be updated or changed. That would be okay. So I think not only does Jahai uh, raise tough questions about the adequacy of our examinations. I guess I want to leave us thinking as we head into the discussion period, there are changes coming both in technology to examine the brain that we'll have to decide how aggressively do we want to use those, how much money do we want to spend to use those. If people think there are ways to reverse uh, damage even after what we now accept as a test for brain death, is that something that everybody has a right to try? Is that something that uh, we're going to have to use to accommodate and uh, work with uh, before we start uh, declaring a death that may have implications for transplant and other domains? I don't much care. I think I'm a believer in the dead donor rule. So I think we've got to get death straight before we worry about what does it mean for everything else. And lastly, what role do patients and families have to play in this? New Jersey accommodated a two uh, degree standard, and that's what they chose to do politically, and so be it. But is that wise to put the acceptance of death in the hands of patients or their families? Um, it's tough for families to accept death. It's tough, uh, I made a joke about my father being dead, but it's hard for me to accept that he's 98 years old, he's been dead a year. They still find it hard to accept it. I know he's sneering about this talk, for example. <laughs> he sat in his room. Um, so, uh, I think he did, maybe it's new, yeah, he did. Uh, <laughs> so I think we have an issue there about how far do we extend paternalism and professional judgment? Where does that intersect family values and the ability of people to decide for themselves how they want to deal with the death of a loved one? Thank you. All right, we will, we will stop promptly at 7, so, uh, but we do have a few minutes here. Um, and I would, I would ask that uh, you not have long preambles to your, to your <laughs> statements, that they, be, that they be brief and preferably a question. Um, and we're going to... Uh, and we have, uh, so, uh, Blair over here, Lisa over here with microphones, um, and I'll let, I can see there's somebody back here who's very anxious to. Do you have a microphone over there, Lisa? Yeah. Oh, we got it right here. Okay, great. Oh, excuse me, well, I'm Dr. Machado from Havana, Cuba. I wanted to remark that I was called for the International Brain Research Foundation in September uh, 2014, and when they commented about the Jahai, I, uh, uh, I proposed uh, to do some ancillary tests that were prescribed by U.S. licensed 
the physician. And I have the result here, in the recent publication. Uh, after I processed the, the raw data, I demonstrated preservation of the intracranial pressure uh, tested by MRI. And you can see here, moreover, the, I, using uh, MRI operant diffusion coefficient and compared with normative data, we demonstrated a live tissue in Jahai. Moreover, in MRI tractography, we demonstrated the preservation of tracts. Some, some of them were disrupted, but some of them were <laughs> there. Regarding EEG, the problem of EEG is the electrocardiogram artifact. My team has developed a software to eliminate artifact for the electrocardiogram, and then we demonstrated true EEG over two microvolts per, per division. Also, quantitative EEG demonstrated the preservation of the EEG spectrum. And also, uh, we apply heart rate variability for to test autonomic system. And all components generated in the brainstem and upper central autonomic system were preserved. <coughs> but the most striking result was, <coughs> excuse me, was that on the mother boys, we demonstrated, uh, we demonstrated autonomic response, emotional response, that is here using the heart rate variability. That is <coughs> in agreement with the video shown by the professor Chu. Uh, I don't think that she's not, she's not brain dead, but she's not minimally conscious. She's, she rests in some place in the spectrum of consciousness not previously described. Uh, do you want to speak at all to that? Or? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Calixto, for sharing that information. And I, I hope we will uh, all read Calixto's paper now that it has just come out. And thank you for sharing the, uh, the slides for me to show here. Uh, thank you, Calixto. Yeah, wh whether, whether you call it minimally conscious state or something else, I think the terminology is going to be changing soon. Uh, I, I do think she fulfills what the Aspen group defined in 2002 as minimally conscious state, but the, the terminology is probably going to change soon. Okay, uh, Blair. Uh, hi, Mike Nyer Collins <clears throat> from Florida State. Um, I was, my question is for all uh, four of you, whoever wants to comment. Um, but if you could comment on the idea of, we have tests that are diagnostic for uh, brain death. So the, the standard criteria of unresponsiveness, uh, brainstem memory reflexy, and apnea. Those tests um, are supposed to tell us whether an individual is or is not in this particular nosological category that the UDDA defines as irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain. Now we've known for many, many decades that those tests aren't really any good, but what's, they're not good because you can meet those tests and still have some hypothalamic function and other things. <coughs> what is interesting is that as time has progressed, those tests have become the nosological category. So if you test positive by the diagnostic tests, you are now considered to be brain dead. The problem with that is, so long as you follow the procedure, it's now logically <coughs> impossible to have a false positive. Because being brain dead now just means being declared brain dead. So it's impossible to have a false positive, which is, shows there's a problem. So I was wondering if you could uh, comment on that and how the McMath case uh, does or does, does not inform that um, dialogue. Thank you. Well, I guess uh, I would just simply agree with you that I, I think we've recognized for several decades now the gap between what the UDDA says, the complete absence of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem, and we know that actually the criteria do not test for all of those things. And I think that that gap is something we've known about. Uh, Jim Burnett has written about why it should or should not matter. Uh, I think it is one of the points of litigation in the McMath case, actually. And uh, so, uh, uh, as Art says, this is probably, litigation is probably not the right way to work through these scientific problems, but it looks like that's the direction it's going. I would just add to that, you know, what's complicated is that it's not as if tests aren't fallible, and it's not as if the stakeholders also aren't influenced by their own interests, which makes these areas complicated. You think about another space, uh, where that's, that's similar and yet different, the NICUs involving 
Um, babies that are born after hyperstimulation of the ovaries and multiple embryos uh, gestating in the crowding of the womb. Right, so you have now NICUs being some of the most uh, profitable centers of hospitals. A lot of this probably experimentation. If hospitals didn't intubate, respirate, and whatnot, if you're, you're poor and you don't have that type of access. I mean, the difference between individuals who may have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to achieve pregnancy through assisted reproductive technology, where they may have gestated quadruplets, uh, sextuplets, which, which we've seen, and the very aggressive care that's provided afterwards. And sometimes there, is, uh, th there are babies that are able to live after that, and sometimes not. Certainly poor people who uh, gestate sextuplets, where those opportunities are not available, and the hospital isn't even thinking about making sure that those babies will get the kind of care that they might get someplace else, also exposes this, this fragile line. There's something that was very revealing in the slides, one of the slides and videos that you showed, and it was the parent saying, now they can't say, you can't hear your mother. How much of this is also about parents, and the very complicated space in which parents occupy? And it's compl complicated by law, and it's complicated by medicine. And I don't want to overwrite the point because my colleagues will speak to these issues, but I hope that we're able to come back to them tonight or over the course of the next couple of days to think about these nuances. And even if the legislature, um, even if courts are not the best places to decide these issues, it's complicated. Our legislature is the best places either. Okay, let's, let's move on. Yep. Hi, Sam Shemi from Montreal. Um, I think that we should, uh, we have an obligation to be open to scientific facts that teach us things. Um, but science is based on observation, repetition, and reproducibility, and I just want to clarify a few things. One is, Dr. Schumann, um, uh, you relied on your opinions based on videos, but you were unable to reproduce those things by direct observation by yourself. Is that correct? That's right. She was not right. in a responsive state when I was there. So, th so you could not confirm that they were real based on your clinical evaluation. The implication of a patient being able to respond to a command means that she can hear and she can process and she can transmit in order to have a voluntary purposeful motor response. How do you reconcile that with a flat EEG absent uh, evoked potentials that include the inability to hear based on electrical testing and the inability to transmit uh, s sensor responses through the brainstem. Thank you. I was hoping that somebody would ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, uh, could, could you call up uh, the slide at the end of my presentation? Uh, uh, possibly, but why don't you start your answer here. But um, Blair, can you help me? <clears throat> Please? <laughs> I would also suggest to you that the only test that you could rely on to confirm what you're alleging is a functional MRI. And if this patient can teach us something, Last line? that is something that would be very important to, to do. Okay, I'll take it from that. Right. that actually she can demonstrate those neurological transmissions that you are alleging that you're observing by video. Yeah, I, I agree that a functional MRI would be fascinating. So uh, this is our last slide. So uh, go, go, go back there. Here. Okay. So regarding flat EEGs, Calixto did an EEG at a different time, and it was not isoelectric. So the one that was done at Rutgers was interpreted as isoelectric. I haven't seen it myself. Uh, but uh, anyway, the uh, EEG samples only uh, the cortex directly under the scalp. So there's lots of cortex that the EEG doesn't sample. EEG does not sample deep nuclei. Um, amazingly, consciousness can be present in children without cerebral cortex. They can interact with the environment in a meaningful way. Uh, I've published about this. 
uh, of course, acquired brain destruction is different from congenital brain absence or partial brain absence. N uh, nevertheless, uh, the EEG per se doesn't necessarily tell you about if there's uh, awareness of the environment. Uh, and since her responsiveness is intermittent, how do we know if her EEG activity might be intermittent also? And if Calixto's EEG found activity and Rutger's EEG didn't, uh, well, maybe that supports the idea of it being intermittent. Next slide. Uh, regarding the brain kind of cheating here, you know. response, <laughs> <laughs> the, the frequency of the click stimulus is above the spectrum of the human voice. So audiologists consider the brainstem auditory evoked response an inadequate test of hearing. Uh, absence of wave one is common in brain death and doesn't imply anything about the integrity of the downstream nuclei that generate waves in the brainstem evoked response. But Importantly, it can be due, uh, absence of it can be due to de desynchronization of the action potentials and not only to absence of action potentials. So uh, there are reports of intact hearing despite absent wave one following acoustic neuroma surgery, for example. Next. Uh, Two more. Somatosensory evoked potential uh, is not surprising given her, her MRI scan. Uh, the somatosensory evoked potential is determined mainly by large diameter fibers and the posterior columns, which mediate position and vibration sense. But it implies nothing about the downstream integrity of somatosensory pathways, especially of other modalities. Uh, and uh, it implies nothing about the integrity of the motor uh, descending pathways or other pathways. Next. Uh, and the visual evoked potential, of course, is not surprising at all that, that she had no response to that. Um, and she's presumably cortically blind. Uh, that implies nothing about consciousness, neither does do the other evoked potentials. So this is all speculation, of course, uh, how to reconcile that with the videos. But uh, I find the videos compelling and I, I don't understand everything about what the tests are telling us, but I find the videos more compelling than the tests. Claire? Yeah. This is a question for Art. In the beginning, you talk about China does not, rec never recognizes uh, brain death. At the end of your talk, you re reiterate the concerns about the organ procurement. Will you elaborate more about the potential abuses, in particular in countries that don't have transparency? Not at length today. <laughs> it's an issue for a different day. But <clears throat> generally speaking, if you don't have brain death in a country and you are performing a large number of transplants, then you're going to have to rely on living sources, some of which may be uh, turned into donors by uh, practices like execution. So that's been the charge that floats around with respect to China and some other places as well. That's more what than I, a charge. Right, <laughs> it's quite a charge. But put that aside, that can be next year's topic. What I wanted to uh, say was, there's a tendency to say, look, we can't give up on brain death because we need organs for transplant. And that's not my view. My view is we have to get death straight and then work around it for transplant. The public won't support cutting corners to get people dead to get organs. It just doesn't pop up in the polls. You don't hear people uh, sort of saying, I accept that. Uh, they're occasionally, you know, the odd article, which may appear. But uh, <laughs> the political will to go that direction is nothing. So <clears throat> that's where the uh, issue lies here, I think, is saying, uh, do we have to beef up the tests? Could we beef up the tests? Is it affordable to beef up the tests? Is everybody got to be declared dead by putting their head in an fMRI machine, boy, that would be quite a uh, expenditure and quite a dis, uh, well, let's put it this way, it'd be a useful stock investment in certain um, 
scanning technology. So <clears throat> I don't know how we want to go in that area. We do accept error rates in testing. There are people who have, Michelle, I thought it was going to go this way. There are people have their breasts removed on tests that turn out to be erroneous in the genetic testing area. We learn about mutations we didn't know about 10 years ago when people were taking drastic measures to prevent <clears throat> breast and ovarian cancer. So it may be that that's just an area we live with because, you know, we're going to live with a certain degree of uncertainty. Thank you. Lisa, are we? Um, this is a question for Dr. Goodwin and Dr. Schumann, and it's about um, if Jahai is somewhere between brain dead and conscious, and once we're able to define this, will this be considered a win or a loss for the black community in 50 years' time? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it may not be a question you can answer right now, yeah. maybe towards the end of the conference, but I'm curious to see where this leads um, medicine and race. Like, are we going to be talking about this the same way we talk about the Henrietta Lacks case, or is this going to be considered more of an influential case in moving medicine to understanding all the different aspects and socioeconomic factors that it encompasses? Because watching their parents um, talk about how now they can't say that you can't hear your mother, that one really struck home because my mom's always saying I can't hear her. And like knowing that, <laughs> um, knowing that she might be somewhere inside still responding in the ways that she's able to, I'm wondering if this is going to be a win in yeah. eventually or if this will still be a loss in some way. Well, there's also the question of how isolated is this particular case? Can we use this case as definitional? You know, one of the things that John Paris has said is that, you know, our questions in this domain are not how to treat, uh, but whether to treat. And whether to treat has great economic implications, and that's difficult for us to, you know, to resolve in our society. And as we're talking about death, notice that we don't mention, uh, because of problems in the past, what is life? When do we know that life truly is there, right? And so we can look at the videos and see that the videos are so incredibly compelling. And you can feel through what the mother articulates that there's something quite profound in the relationship with her daughter. And in that way, you know, you can almost hear Sojourner Truth, right? Ain't I a woman, right? Like, like still this articulation of, can you hear me? But is this case a one-off? And what does victory mean? Does victory in this case have some relation to do with race, the fact that resources would be expended over time for this one case for a young woman who may never have greater functionality than what it is that we see in this video? And it makes me wonder about questions such as, is life the ability to enjoy? Is life the ability to experience happiness? Is life the ability to experience some form of pleasure? It, clearly we have, there is, there is life that we can see and it's life that's being supported by resp respiration and intubation. But I think that there are harder social questions for us to think about. I don't know if 50 years from now we can think about Jahai's case and actually say that it's a victory or that it is no victory. Um, I think that there are some who experience right now, I think her mother would say that she is victorious. She got her daughter out of California, where in California her daughter was considered dead. She has her daughter now in New Jersey, and I think she would not be alone because there are others who are in New Jersey. There's a reason why New Jersey has this particular law. And I think that there are those in New Jersey who are very happy that this law exists. I have not heard cases from New Jersey, though, where situations such as Jahai's has been re have been reversed in the ways in which people typically would associate with coming back or having a kind of healthy life. And that's complicated. And I think we should see it as complicated. And I hope over the next couple of days we can really unpack how difficult that is to answer that question. One final quick question here. If, uh, I, well, I'm well, sorry, we're in the back. <laughs> okay, hang on a second, all right. Thank you all so much. I have a question for Dr. Trude and Dr. Schumann. Dr. Trug, in the beginning you mentioned that there is a possibility that Dr. Schumann's data might suggest that Jahai recovered partially from a state below where the current line is drawn at brain death. 
and that that might mean that there's a potential return from that state of brain death. But Dr. Schumann, you mentioned that there is no point at which her cerebral circulation could have been completely cut off because that would have led to inevitable decay. So I'm wondering to what extent do you think that this is a possibility of returning from a state of brain death versus the limitations in our current diagnostic tools for determining circulation and electrical function? So uh, I'll hold my comments. Alan, what, what, do you want to comment on that? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, I would like to respectfully take issue with your slide that shows the bright line and, yeah. and the part below. Uh, <laughs> um, because across from the, the bright line, you wrote irreversible apneic unresponsiveness as, as brain death. But the the UDDA doesn't define it that way. The no. UDDA defines it as irreversible loss of all brain <coughs> functions. So uh, the only way that you can be sure that the loss of brain functions is irreversible is if you're at the bottom of your mm -hmm. slide where there's total liquefaction of the brain, uh, which is like the MRI scans and CT scans of the chronic brain death cases I showed you before Jahai's MRI scan. So that, that is brain death, and that's why it's irreversible. So, so this is, we're going to have to take this conversation <laughs> offline, because uh, the, the neuropathology of brain death, though, has not been consistent with, with uh, right. extreme necrosis exactly. or a liquefied brain. Exactly. So, so, the, so the diagnostic criteria don't comport right. with with the UDDA definition. You can see how we just love this topic. Um, I, I, please come up to the, to the, to the st uh, stage afterwards and ask your question, because I promised I was going to end at 7. Okay? So we're going to stop here. If you have further comments or questions, please come up. I hope to see you tomorrow morning. Just one second. What? Oh, we have a reception. Yes, they are. We have a reception yes. upstairs. Yes.